Good day, everybody. My name is John Stewart, and I'm one of the coaches here on ehab.care. And today, I want to talk to you guys about what is known as the dry drunk or the dry drunk syndrome. Um, and it's a term that you've probably heard or will hear coming into this recovery context. Um, so the term dry drunk was originally coined by the creators of the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it was further defined by the author R.J. Solberg in his 1970 book, The Dry Drunk Syndrome. And he defined it as the presence of actions and attitudes that characterized the alcoholic prior to recovery. So essentially what that's saying is, is that some people are able to put the chemicals down, but that's all they do. Very little else changes. Now, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to share my personal experience of the dry drunk syndrome because I believe that I was a dry drunk for the first four or five years um, of my journey. Um, I walked into a homeless shelter called the Ark in uh, Cape Town in April of 1998. I asked for help and, and my, my, that's the last time I, I, I used mind and mood altering substances. So I, I checked in there, I ended up staying in the Ark for three and a half years, um, mainly because I was, I, was, I was too afraid to leave. I'm not sure how I was going to normalize or fit in with the rest of the world. So I created a comfort zone for myself there in the Ark and I stayed in the Ark. Um, but even though I was chemical free, my attitude didn't really change much. Or my belief system, or my thought life, or the way I behaved um, didn't really change. Um, I was hostile, I was resentful, I was angry, I was sarcastic, um, and I was still dodgy. So, after three and a half years, I left the Ark and moved into Fishhook, which is in Cape Town, South Africa. I joined a church there, and very naively, and also in, in my arrogance, uh, believing that because I'm three and a half or four years clean, that uh, it somehow qualified me to rescue all the, the addicts in that part of Cape Town. And in those days, it was very much a methamphetamine uh, thing, or tick as we call it here in South Africa. So I put a, uh, I put a notice on our church door, which was on the main street in Fishhook, uh, free drug counseling or something to that effect um, and very quickly discovering that I knew nothing that I was completely out of my depth and over my head because the response to that sign on the door was phenomenal I mean they, they, it, people just started pouring in looking for help both the addicts and very much this is the significant others and the families of many of those methamphetamine addicts um, in that area and uh, uh, quickly coming back to earth with a, with a massive bump suddenly realizing that I actually know nothing I've, I've opened Pandora's box here I've got no clue what I'm doing how to counsel these people what to suggest to them um, And feeling overwhelmed, absolutely overwhelmed, feeling lost, feeling um, stupid, feeling embarrassed, feeling uh, 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 ashamed even, and, and, and being stuck in my arrogance of, of not really asking for help. Um, that's, that's also one of the hallmarks or characteristics of uh, uh, dry drunk people is that they're very self-sufficient um, and very self-driven. But I was in a unique space and I prayed to God 
Um, I, was, I am a believer. I pray to God, please help me. I've, 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 I've messed up here. I've bitten of more than I can chew. And I, I, I desperately need help. And it was shortly after that prayer, maybe even a day, um, I met Colin Garnett, who is the creator and founder of ehab.care. Um, at that time, he was running a, a treatment center in uh, a suburb called Observatory in Cape Town, which was basically a, a rehab for um, the, the hardcore down-and-out addicts and alcoholics that were mostly on the streets. Um, he was running a program there. So I met Colin, and Colin came alongside me and started to teach me and mentor me um, and grow me and really challenge me um, about my attitude and behavior, which I didn't like. Um, and my, my initial reaction was maybe I need to avoid this guy like the plague. But also realizing that, listen, maybe this is the guy, uh, this is, maybe this is an answer to prayer. This is a godsend. And this is the guy I need to get closest to, which is what I chose to do. Um, so this went on for another couple of years where I started to do my own 12-step work. An, an interesting point is, I, I, never, I never came into it. My first, four, my first five years, maybe six years of the last time I used, I never set foot in AO or NA or in coming to any kind of counseling or 12-step context. But I, I, I ended up in church ministry. I ended up being the head of a, of a Christian ministry that I had unwittingly founded and started. And uh, people in the church were treating me as a, as a, you know, a, a, a church elder, minister, the head of a, a Christian ministry. Um, but I was a, a massive hypocrite. I mean, I, I was f completely faking it. You know, I, in, in church, I was all smiley, smiley, nice, nice. You know, the, the, the picture of the perfect Christian, the perfect counselor, the perfect head of a Christian ministry. You know, doing all of that, going through the motions. But inside, boiling with unresolved grief, rage, anger and resentment. And all of that would come out when I, I, I just I'd go out the church and across the parking lot into Long Beach Mall and all that negativity, all that rage would come out on the service industry. The waiters, the tellers, um, etc. A, a really rude, short, abrupt, hostile, toxic even. Okay? Um, and actually, not even really realizing it. Um, not realizing it. Um, Colin obviously saw this um, and, and, and started to challenge me on it, um, which I didn't like and I don't think I responded well to initially, um, being told what to do or being confronted or challenged. Um, I come out of a significant addiction where I've, not, I've, I've, I've been a rebel, a, a significant rebel, a, a, a major problem with authority, uh, very antisocial, um, in my behavior but also there was a part of me that wanted to change and wanted to grow so Colin gave me a step four by this time Colin had moved up the garden route he had opened a rehab in Storms River called Bethesda Addiction Treatment Center and, and prior to that Colin had given me a step four to look at to do and I'd opened that step four and had a look at those questions and thought stuff that I'm not going anywhere near that. And ducked and dived it. But my, my situation, my circumstances in the church, in that ministry, in my personal life were escalating for the worst significantly. The resentments were piling up. The rage was becoming harder and harder to control. I was being 
starting to become hostile and snappy and short with people in the church, um, with fellow I was in trouble, and I knew it. Um, I reckon I'd relapsed in every sense of the word other than picking up and using. And the only reason I hadn't picked up and used was I never lost sight of the fact that the pain behind me was greater than the pain I was in or greater than the pain in front of me. I never lost sight of that. I think that's the main reason I never relapsed back into using. But I think I relapsed in just about every other way. So I went up to Storms River to Colin and I did step four there. I was the first client at Bethesda. I spent two months there and I did step four. And, and I have to tell you, it's probably one of the most life-changing experiences I've ever had. I dealt with, I dealt with so much stuff. I dealt with my trauma, I dealt with my abuse issues that, that happened to me, I dealt with my disappointments, my failures, my low self-esteem, my people-pleasing, I, I dealt with so many things, my, 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 my resentments, my, my rage and anger, um, it was awesome. Um, coming back to Cape Town... Um, and, and coming back into, the, into, into my ministry at the church and the church life. And I, I kid you not, everybody, and I mean everybody, noticed. They were like, wow, what happened to you, John? I was experiencing freedom maybe for the first time in my life. And I think finally in recovery that I'm in today. Um, so I was an unwitting dry drunk. I wasn't. I didn't. I didn't go through the process ignoring um, counsel and suggestions from other people. I just. I didn't know any better. Okay, and I think that's one way a person can become a dry drunk. However, in my experience, in my professional life, working as, a, as an addiction specialist and an addictions counsellor in a treatment centre for 15 or so years, I've watched this dynamic develop in many people. Okay? And it can start with how they, they, why they come to treatment in the first place. One of the things I discovered, and this might sound, this might sound strange, but one of the things I discovered was that many people come into treatment not to deal with their addictions, but to protect their addictions. They, they, they're under duress, so they come to silence people, to please people. Um, keep everybody off their back, maybe get away from their consequences, have a bit of a, you know, let the, let the dust settle, let the heat go down. Come into treatment... They've convinced themselves that they want to stop on a level. So there's, a, there's, 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 quite, a, pardon, there's, there's quite a big degree of self-deception in play. They come into treatment. Um, some of them have maybe been in treatment before, so they know how it works. Others will quickly adapt. They'll come into treatment. They'll, they'll quickly suss out how it works. And then they'll do treatment. Like, uh, like if, 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 if I get, I've been to prison, if I get sent to prison again, I, I, I know what to do to survive in prison. I know how to do prison. I know exactly what to do to get from beginning to end. And, and people do treatment like that. And, and this is, this is a, a big contributor to the dry drunk syndrome, is that they've, they've, they've come into treatment um, with... A hidden agenda with twisted motives, not really to deal with the addiction, maybe to try and control the consequences um, to please people. And they, they go through that process believing that by being in rehab, it's somehow going to automatically uh, propel them into recovery, that when they leave, they'll be in recovery. And this is, this is quite a deadly uh, myth. Um, 
the people that do treatment like that, they come in, they don't really take any kind of ownership or responsibility. They go through the motions, lots of compliance, and leave like that. Might stay off the, the chemicals. Might there's some some addicts are stubborn enough to stay off and not pick up again, but nothing really else changes. Okay. And the, the characteristic of those people, that the, the two main or the three main characteristics of those people is they are miserable, they are unpleasant to be around, very little changes in their worldview, belief system, attitude. And I've seen it, it's some some of these guys, some of these, some of this uh, type person can be so unpleasant, so miserable, so arrogant, so whatever, that I've, I've seen significant others even attempt to sabotage their recoveries in order to get the person previous back. Because the previous person was more tolerable, less miserable. Um... So it's a it's a it's a real dynamic. It's a powerful dynamic. Okay, um, another place where you'll see captain uh, where you'll see the dry drunk is is in the rooms, um, where again they've they've gone through a process, um, lots of compliance, no real ownership, um, nothing's really changing, but they'll 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 go into into the the, the NA and. AA fellowships and become captain recovery. Um, you'll, if you've been in in twelve step fellowships, you'll know what I'm talking about. They, that's the, the the very dogmatic, uh, almost Nazi fundamental type. You know that the big big time gum flappers, um, but really quite annoying, irritating, unpleasant. Uh, people and some people mistakenly make sponsors out of these people which is a mistake if you if you're new to the process and you're going into AA and NA do not make captain recovery your spot do not ask them to sponsor you they are gum flappers and big hollow drums they've got nothing of any substance um, to to give you or, or to or, or to guide you with and it's just a question of time before the right crisis comes and knocks them off that pedestal um, and relapse. Okay? So, there's some, my personal experience as a dry drunk. Um, I was unwitting though, and, and uh, I, I, as soon as I saw it, and as soon as I became aware of it, I wanted to change it. I didn't want to be that person. And, and I did everything that I could not to be a dry drunk. I did of all the suggestions. I did the work. I followed the guidance. Okay? And, my, and, and I've never looked back since then. My, 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 my recovery today is awesome. I know what freedom is. I know what joy is. I know what happiness is. I know, I know what it means to feel content. Um, the dry drunk never experiences that. They're too miserable. Okay? So, in part two, we're going to look at characteristics. We're going we're gonna to look at a, a nice long inventory. I think there's 10 or 12 characteristics. We'll unpack it a, a, a bit deeper and look at a solution. If you if you if you can identify this in yourself, firstly that's a that's a that's a plus, okay. If you can see it in yourself and you want to change it, you're already well into the in, in, into the solution. But we'll have a look at that in part two. Uh, thanks for listening me listening to me now, and I'll see you shortly. And my mouse has disappeared. There it is. Okay, welcome back to part two. So in part two, let's ask the big question. Are you a dry drunk? 
Listen to these. Have you recently quit drinking or drugging? Are you white knuckling it and barely holding on? Does your family walk on tiptoes around you? Do you feel angry all the time and have trouble expressing your feelings? Has anyone ever told you they wished you were still using? Or better yet, for years they wanted you to stop using and now they are offering to roll you a joint or pour you a drink. Has anybody called you Captain Recovery? And if, uh, if any of this sounds familiar, if you can say yes to pretty much all of this, I think the jury's out. Um, you've got something to look at. You've got some work to do. So let's expand. Um, let's expound. There's a nice word. So we'll go look at some, we'll look at the characteristics now. If you can tick all of these boxes, then you're dry drunk. And uh, I could definitely tick all of these boxes. Not now, today, but back in those early years that I was talking about. So, angry and resentful. A dry drunk never wanted to quit and resents it. And, and, and there I was talking about why they came to treatment in the first place. Very often, it's not, to, it's not to deal with the addiction, it's to protect the addiction. They may act out their resentments through passive or not so passive behaviors. You might find yourself walking on tiptoes or agreeing with them just to keep the peace. Um, ask the people around you, how do they feel? about your process, about your recovery, about where you're at. Rigidity. No flexibility. Only black or white, right or wrong, good or bad, all or nothing. Thinking and statements. Conversations with a dry drunk can feel more like a power struggle than anything else. And uh, here's your uh, captain recovery. Very rigid very dogmatic, unmoving, uh, believes that uh, the only way that they got clean is the only way to get clean, um, will very often come into the household and start bashing everybody in the household with new information. Um, sarcastic, or as Colin calls it, anger dressed in pink. Not able to express emotions in a healthy fashion. The words come out barbed and hurtful. Dry drunks can be judgmental, very judgmental. And their comments can come across as put-downs. Um, so true of me for a long time. Uh, when I look back, I feel, I feel embarrassed and ashamed at how I've treated people um, in those early years. And... I wish I could go and make amends to that whole mall. Um, Long Beach Mall, where I was, where I used to behave terribly towards the service industry. Um, extreme mood swings. A dry drunk can be depressed one minute and then blow up the next. They may have an explosive temper, leaving the rest of the family feeling confused, fearful and anxious. Um, there's always going to be victims around a dry drunk. There's always going to be people that are battered and bruised and walking on eggshells. Emotionally cold. A dry drunk has difficulties expressing all emotions, except anger. They may appear cold and hostile and punish you by withholding their affection. So that's indicative of how they did treatment. They went, uh, of why they went into treatment. They went into treatment and just and faked it. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why I, I, I really dislike the fake it till you make it uh, narrative. I think it's a rubbish narrative. I think it's a, it's rubbish feedback to give to people. Don't fake it till you make it. Horrible advice. Um, every time you blow it, every time you fail, you get up, you take ownership, you take responsibility. And you, and you lean back into the, into, in, in, into the struggle. Okay? Not fake it till you make it. 
This is, this is the consequence, what we're reading here, of fake it till you make it. You get dry drums. Um, nothing is ever good enough. No matter what you do, you can't please them. Sugar is too sweet, a donut too round, coffee too hot or cold. A dry drunk will find fault in everything. This is really, really unpleasant and miserable. You owe me. There's a sense of entitlement. A dry drunk just gave up their best friend and the world owes them for it. A dry drunk will punish their loved ones for making them quit. They justify their anger by saying things like if you hadn't made me quit, I wouldn't be acting like this. So one of the big characteristics of chemically dependent people is a, an, an immense sense of entitlement. And you know what I'm saying when I say that because you've, you, 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 you've, you've either had that entitlement or you've experienced that entitlement from somebody you know who's, who you love who's suffering with an addiction. And, and again, they go into treatment and they just fake it. And that sense of entitlement doesn't go away at all. In fact, it can probably be even more hostile without the chemicals. Self-pity, poor me, I'll never have fun again. You might as well kill me now. Oh, been there. Yep. Grandiose, an overblown sense of self-importance and worth. A dry drunk views their only downfall as drinking or drugging. Once they stop using, they feel superior to others and want to direct their lives. And, and this is what I mentioned earlier. They'll come home and they'll start bashing. They'll start swinging their new knowledge around like a baseball bat. Um, psychoanalyzing everybody and projecting all of this on everybody else. Um, awful. Awful people. No humility, sense of entitlement, arrogant, grandiose, bullying, blaming, blaming others for their shortcomings. Dry drunks become very good at taking other, people, other people's inventory, but lack the ability to see their own. Instead, they blame others for their poor behavior. Feeling bored and dissatisfied with life. A dry drunk may have periods of lethargy. Lethargy. Lethargy? Lethargy. I don't know. It's a big word. Nothing interests them anymore. Their mood is one of blah. So boredom. Another big characteristic. Um, dry drunks are going to find themselves getting very bored very quickly. Um, people in a proactive recovery are very rarely going to find themselves getting bored because they're proactive. Um, boredom is a choice. People choose to be bored, and it's a, and it's an angry place. It's a face of anger. It's a it's a it's a, it's a complete lack of gratitude and contentment. Um, and you'll 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 never find a happy bored person. Oh, I'm so bored. It's always a bored man. Okay, so it's an angry place, and it's also a choice. And it, and very probably coming from a, from a dry drunk place. Euphoric recall. Glamorizing their past usage. There is a sense of nostalgia for the good old days. A dry drunk may forget that using almost killed them and tore their family apart. So glamorizing the past, glamorizing using, um, euphoric recall, indulging and, and, and letting FOMO uh, escalate. FOMO is the fear of missing out. Um, Takes a lot of people out, FOMO. So there's a whole bunch of characteristics. If you can tick all of those boxes, um, I, I, I think there's the evidence. You don't really need any more convincing. So, how do I change it? No rocket science. Uh, very basic, but very difficult. Recognize it. Can you recognize it? Do you recognize it? Own it. 
own it and you might need to put pen to paper to really own it because you've got to be specific about what you own and you can't just vaguely own it you've got to specifically in detail own it and if you do step work um, your step work will demand that that kind of self honesty do step work here we go go to meetings and share it share it share it to death share it everywhere expose it every time it makes an appearance okay humble yourself to admit your behavior out loud because it might not go away just because of one lecture this is you're going to have to work at it and it's going to and it's going to keep making appearances okay the difference is is you have insight now and self-awareness and you've started to practice the ability to take ownership and responsibility Be willing to make amends. Now that sounds easy, but for some it's hard. And I'm, and I'm not talking about saying sorry. We don't say sorry. Making making amends is if you if you go and make amends, you're making a, 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 a proper apology. Okay. You've got to be specific about what you're making amends for. What you're apologizing for. The apology, the amends, has got to be as big as the disrespect. Otherwise, sorry, oh, I'm sorry. That's a slap, eh? That's a, listen, shut up and stop making me feel guilty thing. I mean, it's a, sorry. If, if sorry was a brand of toilet paper, um, your family wouldn't buy it to wipe their bums with it. They've heard sorry from you that many times. So I'm not talking about sorry. Be willing to make amends means you get really, really specific off the back of self-honesty about your behavior yeah i need help go on say it mean it and let people help you no rocket science there you go that's dry drunk um reach out we're all available um if if you if you want to get into a into a, a, a you want to have a conversation with me you get into a a, a a deeper conversation about it come and find me on ehab.care um, or go and look at this there's there's, 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 a, there's a good few recovery coaches there i could highly recommend any one of them reach out talk to one of us okay we can help you with this we can steer you we can guide you we can give you the right step work we can have we can we can we can put the right accountability um, program around you so that you can start making some headway with us and that's it thanks for listening guys um, just one more slide we're just going to say thank you over there um, and, a, and, and a few announcements so follow me there thanks for watching everybody um, please take note that um, I actually recorded this particular share stroke lecture a little while ago and since then the ehab.care website has been upgraded and updated and is now ehab.healthcare and not ehab.care and as I mentioned in previous slides if you want to get into a, 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 a more therapeutic relationship an ongoing relationship with me um, probably the best way to come and find me is on ehab.healthcare um, there are also a bunch of other recovery coaches there. I think there's about maybe eight of us in total. Um, and I can highly recommend any one of them. Um, the ehab.healthcare website is a, an online addiction um, support program. There's a, a, a couple of very good courses on there. Um, the main one obviously being the Valley of Addiction, which is the 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 rehab treatment program from bethesda addiction treatment center that's now got online um, so it's a full um, rehab program available online um, not everybody has to go to rehab and it can be used as a treatment program and it can be used as an aftercare program for people coming out of treatment um, it's facilitated by um, experienced coaches and counselors uh, of which I'm one as I said 
Um, it's very robust. It's formidable. It can really help you. Um, and it's a it's a, a really important alternative to going into a treatment center. Um, as you know, we're in COVID-19 times and traveling is not easy. Getting into rehabs is not easy. And also because of the financial aspect. So it's extremely affordable if you compare it to having to go into a treatment center. I'm saying that some people do need to go into treatment centers. Um, uh, 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 doing a, a, a recovery program online might not be enough for them. They might need more support uh, and more containment. Um, but that's not true for everybody. So think about it. Um, if you need more than just an online program and you want to go uh, look for a treatment center, you can, you can drop me a line and I can help you do that as well. Um, the other courses on ehab.care are there is a, a mindfulness stroke CBT course for people in isolation. It's been specially formulated for uh, COVID-19 times. People that are um, long-term uh, stuck indoors. Um, there's not a, not a lot of connection. Um, the relationships are suffering. They're struggling. Um, depression and all of that. So go have a look at that mindfulness CBT course. Um, it could very well help you or help somebody you know. Um, and the other course on there is uh, uh, Parenting Styles, um, facilitated by Colin Garnett as well. Colin Garnett does uh, the, the Valley of Addiction and the, not the CBT, Parenting Styles. Now, it's, it's, it's having a look at all the different parenting styles that could... Uh, predispose your children to addictions. So a, a challenging course, go have a look at it. Um, but again, very effective and very informative. So those are the three courses available on ehab.healthcare. Um, if you want to get, like I said, into a, 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 a better or a, a more lasting relationship with me, all my details are over there, including the new URL for ehab.healthcare. Um, ehab.healthcare is a very good website. It's very functional, very user-friendly. Check it out or come and find me on one of the other contact things there. Please, lastly, help me by subscribing to my YouTube channel, liking the video, and clicking the little... Uh, notification bell alarm thingy so if you want to get notified of uh, new content um, you can get notified because I will be doing new content I'm going to start I'm working towards starting doing regular smaller um, recovery stroke relapse stroke live stroke um, podcasts or shares or information clips so stay tuned um, if you want to share this video, please feel free. If you want to use it uh, in a recovery group or at, in, in your treatment center or whatever, please feel free. And that's it from me. Um, and I will see you on the next video. Thank you.